perhaps many of you would share the sentiment expressed by Augustine in his Confessions of 398. What then is time? If no one asks me, I know. If I wish to explain it to one who asks, I know not. Time is what is measured by the ticks of my watch. Time flows. Time is unstoppable. Time is change. Time rules our lives. Time orders what we do. Time is a scientist's most precious commodity. Time is money. We are immersed in time. We cannot get away from time. Time is the most frequent noun in the English language. Time is what keeps everything from happening at once. There's never enough time, including for this talk. Time is clearly ubiquitous, but what constitutes the essence of time? There are, of course, many things one could say about time. I will focus on what I know best, which is the role played by modern physics. Its insights extend and transcend our naive everyday intuition of time, sometimes running counter to cherished prejudices we have about the world. In doing so, it has already profoundly changed our lives and our relation to time, sometimes in ways you may not even be aware of. My message today is this input from physical theory is bound to continue. Ongoing research, specifically into the quantum nature of time, is potentially as revolutionary for our understanding of the elusive time as is what we already know from physics. I'll try and give you some idea of the how and why. Now, if you ask a cosmologist, that's a physicist, who specializes in the dynamics of the universe as a whole, what's the time? She may say, 13.75 uh, billion years, give and take 170 million. This statement is, firstly, based on Einstein's famous 1915 theory of general relativity, the first theory of space and time, and secondly, on strong corroborating astrophysical evidence. Now, what is this theory about? General relativity is one of the pillars of modern physics, 20th century physics, the other one being quantum theory. Let me highlight here two aspects which are relevant to the issue of time. The first one is Newton got it all wrong. There is no absolute universal time. Time is not the same for everyone, but depends on where you are and how you move. Obviously, this is rather counterintuitive. Instead, Einstein tells us that time is relative. Clocks run slower in strong gravitational fields. An atomic clock on board a satellite 20,000 kilometers above the Earth's surface runs 45 billionths of a second faster per day than an identical clock on Earth because the Earth's gravitational pull is so much weaker up there. Now, this may not seem like much, but if one did not take this effect into account, the global positioning system, or GPS, in your car would become inaccurate within only two minutes. And within a day, the accumulated error would run up to 10 kilometers. Now, this is a beautiful example of how yesterday's pure and undirected research underlies today's successful technologies. But let us move on to the second aspect of general relativity and time. How? Pure science has profoundly changed the way we view ourselves in the grand scheme of things. Now, if the universe has indeed a finite age of 13.75 billion years, does it mean time had a beginning? Was there perhaps a time 
when there was no time, a hundred years ago, including everyone, including Einstein, believed that the universe at large was static and immutable. It's kind of obvious when one looks at the fixed background of stars in the night sky, isn't it? But wrong again. Now, where's the snag? Gravity is always attractive. That means matter, in the form of stars or galaxies, wants to clump together and make the universe contract. That is, unless there was some initial Big Bang making everything fly apart at great speed. This flying apart was indeed measured in the late 1920s. Our galaxies are receding away from us. Our universe is expanding. The universe moves. It's a revolution. And of course, it's all perfectly consistent with Einstein's theory of general relativity. Now, conversely, conversely, extrapolating this motion backwards in time, our universe must have been ever smaller and must have originated from a single point all those billions of years ago. Is this now the last word physics has to say on this? No, it is not. Close to the Big Bang, Einstein's classical theory is no good. It's no longer valid because we are dealing with extremely short distances and high energies. General relativity does not tell us what happens to time in these extreme circumstances. As elsewhere in physics, when describing microscopic processes, say, in atoms or nuclei, we now need a quantum theory of space and time to take over. The search for such a theory of quantum gravity, unifying general relativity on the one hand with quantum gravity on the other, is one of the holy grails of theoretical fundamental physics. Even after 50 years of research, there's no generally accepted complete theory. What are the difficulties? Well, firstly, wild and truly unexpected things can happen when space-time itself begins to quantum fluctuate. And second, because of the extreme smallness of the scales involved, there are no direct experimental tests to guide our theory search. Therefore, until not so long ago, you'd find physicists literally waving their hands when asked about the microstructure of space and time. They'd say, oh, well, everyone knows that space-time dissolves into some bubbly quantum foam at the Planck scale. Well, but there is progress. Very exciting research, which I myself have been involved in over the last 10 or so years, is finally succeeding in making such statements quantitative and therefore part of physical theory. What can our theory, it's called quantum gravity from causal dynamical triangulation, do that others can't? We can explicitly construct dynamical interacting quantum spacetimes and investigate their physical properties with the help of computer simulations. This turns out to be the best one can do in the absence of experiments. Results so far have been amazing. Not only do we find a specific incarnation of quantum foam on very short scales with truly bizarre properties, but on large scales, the theory reproduces a universe that looks very much like our own. Now that we have a candidate theory, does it have anything to say about the nature of time? You bet. These are two of our preliminary findings. Number one, time, according to this theory, seems to be fundamental and not emergent. It is not merely a large-scale phenomenon. We find instead that time and causal order, that is, which allows us to place cause before effect, must persist on the very smallest scales 
in order for the theory to predict a large stable universe like our own. Second, time persists and has no beginning or end. However, the fact that space is three-dimensional and extended as we perceive it around us, and therefore that time has its usual meaning, is not true for all times. There was time before the Big Bang, but there was no space. Something for the philosophers to get their teeth into. Now, let me summarize and conclude. To ask what is time has been an immensely fruitful question in modern physics, with many repercussions in and outside of physics proper. It is an absolutely fascinating question how far this can be pushed. After all, we are working at the very boundary of what we may hope to describe quantitatively using physical scientific method. It is foundational issues concerning the nature of space, time and the universe which inspire young people to go into physics and people of all ages to engage with pure science and the new doors it keeps opening. A deeper understanding of the nature of time will come from two things. A consolidated theory of quantum gravity, including the quantum properties of time, and a theory of how our brains perceive and process reality, including time. Ladies and gentlemen, may good time always be with you.